door. Uh, I don't know if I can handle all this happiness and stimulation of my brain, um, which, uh, I don't know, I feel like uh, very stupid. We have such incredibly smart um, people here, and um, you know, it just it blows me away, all the different thinking, um, all the different um, thinking that's going on by each one of um, all of you. Um, I'm, I'm just so touched and moved by, um, by the work. for me right now, but um, again, uh, moving away from the exhibition model for me where I um, put very lovable, very impressive objects in the walls um, for people who would walk in and have just the attention span of five minutes uh, or so to look at things and then just walk out without really not much um, from it, and that 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 challenge of um, also for myself to actually sit down and take something in, even though I'm so interested, um, the information um, that is consumed and occupying our brains these days, it's just impossible to um, be able to process and. Uh, field meeting for me is, is, a, is a form of exhibition where we take in and have a bit of time to deal with all the discomfort of our own body in a particular space and attention um, to somehow still allow some form of processing of what other brilliant people, artists, thinkers, scholars like you have been dedicating so hard, so much energy to process for yourself, um, to break down, to look at carefully, to attend to, to then have the insights and some form of you know confidence to share that with us um, in in this in this um, in this format. Um, so again, I just wanted to um, you know share that um, beyond the studio visit for me, this really is. Um, a different thinking of uh, what an exhibition can be um, for us uh, because it brings both um, the audience, the process, and uh, the work um, in place in a very lively way. Um, of course, there's lots of problems with it, um, issues with it. Uh, the final work is really not here. Uh, people are forced to do things in just 15 minutes. Um, Christopher's piece, I feel like, could have gone on for one hour, um, the same thing with you, Viva, and, and uh, all the work. Um, but that is also the nature of today, so where we have, we do have to sort of, you know, um, compartmentalize time and just get as much as we can. Um, so I'm not saying that the format doesn't have problems, and um, hopefully we can be, attend to those uh, in future field meetings if I have the energy and if you all continue to play with me. Okay, um, questions. One of the things I guess I felt was um, present here um, was this notion of transformation um, that uh, almost from this morning's session with Ming Wei was very much um, there. Um, different forms of activity that um, either creates possibilities for transformation and change either within an individual, within ourselves, um, and then a large scale um, communities, people, um, presence, uh, and also in a sense, transformation of history. Um, so that's one thing that I, I, I kind of noted uh, from uh, everyone's uh, work, even though they were very different today. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering if that is um, something that any of you really want to talk about, uh, because I, even Possum's piece in the narcissistic <laughs> manner 
of looking at himself and talking about himself and transforming himself into um, different subjects and subjectivities. It, it really was about, again, movement, change, um, rather than um, static place, although um, you were asking us not to move and stay still. Do you want to talk about yeah. that? Yeah, I, I, I heard. Um, I, I, I kind of repeated the opposite, I guess. Did you? Yeah. Okay. It was a manifesto for statistics for John Tanguy. And I, I was kind of inspired from the Skype meeting actually we had about the, I guess the whole thing that is inspired from the studio visits. Some like practices mostly about changing photographs from photograph to photograph or from video to photograph. And that manifesto is actually on my studio for years now. And and this idea was always in my mind, but I had now, somehow I couldn't put it into an exhibition. So the slideshow for 15 minutes was just perfect for me. And I just took the chance and I actually made all the works in this summer and after we had the strike. So that piece was de completely developed for this? Yes, yes. And I just tried to repeat and it didn't really happen because I, I, I wanted to be spontaneous in a way to repeat to also transform the manifesto. But I don't know how it went actually when I was trying to repeat it. Well, it's a process. Yeah. I mean, you have a chance to do that next time. It was beautiful exactly as it was today. <coughs> well, there is a question for me about uh, the way also there is like this form of like repetition in the work, not only with what we see and the photographs that is being re photographed and a lot of thinking about the apparatus and how photography functions, but also the way you perform because it was in some sort an imperfect loop. You were reading the same thing, but you weren't saying all the time that it is the manifesto. So it was like playing a bit with the imperfection, the way of we are looking at what we are looking at. Can you elaborate more about the sort form of the sort form of like reputation that you are using and photographing and re-photographing and re-saying and retelling multiple times? Yeah, well I thought what I showed closer to the mic with the yes. photographs and the slideshows was kind of working together with the manifesto. But by repeating and trying to transform it and trying to, but within my photography practice, I'm also really intrigued if I, if something by chance happens. Like with this works, I, I didn't want to just cut out the photographs or split on them and take a photo of it, but I tried to kind of leave the experience. <laughs> That's actually what happened in the studio. And with the talk, I guess what I tried to do was to push that with words. That's all I can say about the repetition. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's a manifesto, so I tried to begin and end up by clarifying that it's a manifesto of John mm -hmm. But in general, your work involves the, a process of repetition yes. um, uh, and chance, and also just um, manipulation and technique. That that's the technique of getting to a final image, almost there is no final image because yeah. you're always shifting and changing yeah. um, and moving. Yeah, but then as a result of work, I can never be able to show the whole process. That was <coughs> what was inspiring for me to show you, to kind of share the whole process. <coughs> I mean, I'll, I'll say something about that because I, I, I too noticed that there were two manifestos in this segment. You ended with a manifesto and you read a manifesto. And in many ways, I find like the archiving um, to be, uh, to at least evoke the same kind of rigidity of manifesto. It manifesto to me implies a kind of uh, rigidness. But my sense is that all three of you guys, and I consider my, my uh, lecture performance a kind of manifesto too. Like I, all three of you kind of soften the edges, um, is the best way I can put it, of what seemed to be very rigid uh, statements 
or archives historical fact. And that's what I would want to know more about is, is how you, in what ways did you soften and, and, and why? Uh, for me, I think uh, the subject I'm working is uh, completely very harsh and you know, it comes across as a sadness or a depression of our times. But I don't want to take that depression uh, into me or into my practice and I don't want to bring up uh, uh, the situation as a blame or blaming on somebody else. So that's where uh, I think I come uh, across with my art practice so that I can soften it a bit, bear it with other things, um, you know, because nature itself is very beautiful. So it gives you a lot. So I think we need to take certain things back, but it will report if we don't act accordingly. So that's why I like to soften up my, my, my practice and I want to romanticize the situation where I am living with. You know, because if I keep thinking about those negatives all the time, then I will not be able to uh, bring out the positive uh, for the next generations. That's where I feel responsible as an artist that I, I go through that um, aesthetics. And I um, see Stanley Brown has written the manifesto long plan. So if I think I think he reached to that manifesto after read, uh, writing a lot of other manifestos. So I think uh, there is a point of time where you start thinking about softening up things and then you want to take the, the solutions. You want to bring out the solution rather than thinking only the negatives. Sorry, I was a bit confused about two computers and I think I came across a little nervous. But uh, yeah, I would like to talk about Manthan more and more because I think uh, kind of making comparative between the historical um, narrative from our ancient mythology and you know because the sea journey episode was very interesting because it was between the gods and demons where they come together to take out that life nectar. So they wanted to come together only for taking out that positive out of the sea, nothing else. So you know that's what I want to do with my journey from that river that I want to take out the whole negative, uh, deleterious things out of that river and make it a little positive for the next generations. So I want to keep that positivity for myself. Uh, um, I can add <coughs> something about the assumption that archives are so rigid. In fact, Asia Archive for the last 15 years has proven that archives are living, breathing, constantly changing and evolving and they're not rigid. Um, what interests me is when an artist, in this case Lutzi Han, you know, performed a kind of archive, performed the archive, but he also performed something that's not really archival, uh, a text, a spoken narrative, a testimony, and a, a bystander's account. So these are not usually considered archival materials or traces but all of that can be archived. Asia Archive is, is showing that. But also, um, this uh, the idea of what interests me too in working with Singapore is that Singapore is very rigid, <laughs> extremely rigid, also in its narrative of history. So here's a, a you know a crack in that and saying that actually personal testimony, personal story, personal archives become more powerful in our history than the state narrative. Actually, I see a very uh, a, a big connection between what Christopher presented and, and you, uh, and the work of someone like you, but also um, uh, Ray's work. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's a form of parenting. It's a form of guardianship. Um, of course, the, the complications and the, the sophistication of how it's interpreted in, in, in the future, who owns it, how does it get then generated to uh, the next generation, how is it shared, all those things are um, things we can think about. But in essence, um, there was a form of responsibility, uh, again, um, taken. And they, that's then started from an individual, then moved through into an institution which in a sense is the other, the other part.
So but people believe that the riverbed is still a river and they want to go there and take a holy bath and do their ceremonies, which is completely opposite. And it is it coming across as an absurd situation for me because I feel uh, you know uh, belief can make you do impossible things. So you know, I think those impossibilities are uh, very difficult to digest. So for me, it was very uh, difficult to digest that people are coming there and taking the holy bath. And there are people who are living around that river, they drink that water, they make food in that water, and they do every they chores in that water, and there are fields around the river with, which is growing a lot of vegetables, and those vegetables come to our markets, and we don't know whether we are having those vegetables or not, and they are fully contaminated. So it's kind of you know, serve them together. So it come across as an absurdity to me. So I, I feel that there are a lot of contradictions. We don't um, look in in very common person sense of anything. But if you really look at the whole system of our, uh, our you know society building, it's uh, it's absurd. So I, I read it as absurd and I want to live with those beliefs. I don't want to change their belief because if I go and change their belief they really get offended. Like I had this talk uh, with people around the river many a time when I asked them not to just jump into that river because I, I'm standing there and I feel very cross getting into that river. But they say, this is our mother. You cannot you cannot mess up with the people's belief in that sense. If it is their mother, there are people I know, they don't start their day without touching the river, you know, without you know, getting So if you want to educate them, they are not ready So it come across, yeah, as a contradiction. So I look at it, I mean, there are contradictions and there are contradictions. Anyone else has a question? Yes, does he have? Is that I wonder if activism can be conjured as a as positive role modeling rather than a kind of pointing pointing out of, of negatives within the existing system, and I think that's that's what I meant by by synthetic critique um, rather than subversive um, uh, critique or subversive activism because in many ways I mean the the inspiration for for this piece is is really artists of mine who are becoming parents, and you do realize that, that as activists as they might be, as left-leaning and as uncomfortable as they might be with existing social systems or even politics and, and culture, um, the best that they can do is to be as good a role model as possible. So it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of activism. I, I suppose. It's an activism that targets those whom you care about and where one thinks of oneself not as in the margins, uh, picking at the main, but rather as growing into the main, as growing into the mainstream. So if art is going to be assimilated and complicit, that would be the pejorative term that we often use with culture industry, with development, with gentrification. <coughs> How do you do it well? What is the best way to do it? 
since that is what is happening. And I would like to think that it's not a cynical, it's perhaps a realistic, but not a, a, a cynical position. I, I, I would like to think that there is much promise to it. I, does that, does that, I know it's abstract, but does that address the, the question? Yeah. I, I'm not sure that there isn't, I, I mean, I do understand Olivia's question, um, but I feel like we have traversed and left behind um, the question of how to, what, why should we integrate or how can we separate? I, I, I don't know if we need to really ask the question whether uh, this is activism or art or art and activism and because I, I just don't think there is that there's the trans the art practice itself has transformed so dramatically away from this you know studio based uh, lonely manipulation of medium and material for the sake of itself for, uh, for already for so long um, that it it's not I I just don't find it even relevant really to bother um, thinking about but. More, maybe more thinking about and, and dealing with how does it then get translated and how is it made sense of because it, it is it does become so um, so full and almost undigestible because there's so much in, inside of, of, of an artwork produced today um, that again most of us don't have access to in a sense through the presence of the artist to either talk about it or walk us through it or let, uh, let us experience some of their thinking and, and um, where, where they started, how did the, the idea came about and then where is it going and what is its future. Um, I think for me that's more a question that I'm constantly asking how do we, how do I um, understand this work and then as a curator um, and uh, a facilitator, how do I take responsibility to make it have the kind of meaning and impact it has in, a, in an artist um, for uh, the public? Uh, I know most artists don't, you know, they're like, well, if somebody gets it, gets it, they don't, they don't. But I, I don't come from that um, school of thought. Uh, I come from um, a, that responsibility maybe it's that it's just that's the you know the background that I come from but there is for me the, the responsibility of um, translation and facilitation um, and I think that's a different role than for myself because I don't make the work I engage with work um, and uh, so you know uh, but but again there because artists are now taking so many different roles like rocks for example you know, they're, they're going to be curating the Shanghai Biennial, they've already curated an exhibition, um, and uh, so there, there's also this whole traversal of roles that artists are playing, um, and so I, that, that's why it makes it so difficult to have any kind of finality to our, um, you know, uh, putting anything in a package. And I feel like it's okay um, for us to not have packages of uh, what this is or what that is, and, and yet at the same time not give up on um, having some, some clear clarity that what is this and what is that for ourselves. Um, and that's a very big challenge um, in a way. I, I think it's a challenge for me um, to be open, um, but at the same time um, be okay with my, what, what I have understood as also being valid. And, and communicating that validation. It took a long, long time for me to get to this place where I'm actually sitting here and being okay even right now in this minute. My mind is saying, you're talking too much, you're taking too much time, but another part of me is saying, that's okay, I have something to say and I'm going to um, share it and, and hope that it will land in the right, best uh, way. Um, Please take time to talk to the artists during lunch and, and during breaks. Um, I don't know if we have time uh, to uh, continue this discussion. Uh, I apologize for that, but. Was there one last question over there? Or thank you for having time to